Our sermon title is The Seven Lessons from the Manna. So it's no secret that we'll be discussing the manna experience. And for those of us who don't know what I'm referring to, this is when Israel left Egypt during the Exodus and they were traveling through the wilderness on their way to the Promised Land. And during this time, God rained manna down from heaven. And Psalm 78 tells us more about this manna in verse 24 and 25. And God had rained down manna upon Israel to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven. Man did eat angels' food, God sent them meat to the full. So today we're going to talk about angels' food. Who's getting hungry? Angels' food. We are introduced to this angels' food, this manna, in Exodus 16, and Numbers 11. And today we will constantly be reading Exodus 16 and Numbers 11. So I want you all to open your Bibles there at Exodus 16 and put a bookmark in there and then page to Numbers 11 and put a bookmark in there. Because we're going to be flicking about between these two chapters as we study the manna. Because we're going to focus on seven characteristics of the manna. This angel's food. To see what we can learn about the manna. So, put a bookmark in at Exodus 16 and another one at Numbers 11. But then, I'm not hiding or, or revealing any state secrets here when I say, today's message is going to be about Bible study. And I want to encourage personal Bible study through this message. Therefore, I would ask that everyone here notes down the scriptures. And already for your first assignment, you are to read these two chapters at home once I'm done with the message. That should make the congregation less keen to invite me back for any emergency sermons. So when you have Numbers 11 and Exodus 16 then we are ready to start and please take down notes. <clears throat> Everyone ready? Then we'll start with the first characteristic of the manna and we find this in Numbers 11 verse 9. So Numbers 11 verse 9 gives us the first characteristic of the manna. And this is that when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. So the first characteristic is that the manna fell during the night or early in the morning. Exodus 16 verse 14 and 21 tells us more. 16 verse 14 and 21 in Exodus. And when the dew that was lay, that was lay, that lay was gone up, Behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And in verse 21, they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating, and when the sun waxed hot, it melted. So the first characteristic of the manna is that the manna fell early in the morning. Okay, that's our first characteristic. We've seen that the manna falls during, falls during the night, it falls when the dew, when the dew is falling, and as soon as the sun waxes hot, then the manna melts. So are we clear? First characteristic, the manna fell early in the morning. We will then go to Exodus 16, verse 16 and 18, for our second characteristic. The second characteristic is that an Israelite, Israelite could collect as much of the manna as he wanted to, but he would find that he could never collect too much. So reading in Exodus 16, verse 16 to 18, this is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, gather of it every man according to his eating, an omer for every man. According to the number of your persons, take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so. They gathered, some more, some less, but when they meet it with the omer, they found that no one had gathered more. He that had gathered much had nothing over, and that he had gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. So you see, when you get up early in the morning to go and collect the manna, there was no risk of collecting too much. Whatever you gathered, that was exactly what you needed. So the manna was never in excess, always the right amount. That is our second characteristic. We're moving on to the third characteristic of the manna. And that was that it was to be prepared for consumption. We find this in Numbers 11, verse 7 and 8. So Numbers 11, verse 7 and 8, if I may read. And the manna was as coriander seed, 
and the color thereof as the color of bedillium. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills. They beat it in a mortar. They baked it in pans and made cakes of it. You see, the manna was not a fast food available at your takeaway outlet. No, the manna was not a ready-made meal. No, the manna was collected and it had to be prepared for consumption. That is our third characteristic. Now, the fourth characteristic is that the manna could not remain or be preserved overnight. We read this in Exodus 16, verse 19 and 20. So in Exodus 16, verse 19 and 20, we will see that Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was very wroth with them. So we see the fourth characteristic is that the manna cannot remain preserved overnight. We're making good progress. There's only seven characteristics. We're halfway. The fifth characteristic was that the manna was not to be collected on the Sabbath. You see, the one night when the manna was preserved overnight was the Sabbath night or Friday night. And here we have a divine miracle already showing the holiness of the Sabbath. And where do we read of this? Already in Exodus 16. So you see, this is before the Ten Commandments that were given in Exodus 20. How often do we as Adventists hear, well, the Sabbath was given to the Israelites with the giving of the commandments. But actually the Sabbath is already considered holy well before we get to the Sinai experience, here in Exodus 16. Let's read in verses 22 and 23 of Exodus 16. And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath. Unto the Lord, bake that which ye will bake today, seethe that ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. So you see on the Sabbath, the manna was preserved overnight. God gave this divine miracle to now re-educate Israel as to the holiness of the Sabbath. Now if the Sabbath was holy before the Ten Commandments were given in Exodus 20, where does that holiness come from? If the Sabbath was holy before Exodus 20, I'm a novice here, I need you to speak back to me and encourage me along. So, if the Sabbath was holy before Exodus 20, where would that holiness have come from? It can only be the creation event. So when we read in Genesis 2, where we have the creation account, we read Genesis 2, verse 2 and 3, and on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. You see, the Sabbath is universally holy, and it has been holy since creation. It was not given to Israel when the Ten Commandments were given at Sinai. And here in the manna we have an emphasis that the Sabbath is holy. So, the fifth characteristic is that the manna would only remain preserved overnight on the Sabbath night. The sixth characteristic is the taste of the manna. Who knows what manna tastes like? Speak up. It tastes like sweet. Sweet specifically what? Sweet honey and in Numbers, we'll read that it tasted like fresh oil. Numbers 11 verse 8 says it tasted like fresh oil. And Exodus 16 verse 31 said it tasted like wafers of fresh, fresh honey. So that's quite a unique combination. I don't personally confuse honey with oil. But since this is a food coming not from this earth, I guess it tastes like nothing on earth. So oil mixed with honey. We are then at our last characteristic. The manna sustained Israel throughout the wilderness experience. We read this in Exodus 30, 16 verse 35. Exodus 16 verse 35. And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years until they came to a land inhabited they did eat manna. 
until they came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. So there we have it, seven characteristics. It fell early in the morning. You could never collect too much. It had to be prepared for consumption. It could not remain preserved overnight. The one night it remained overnight was the Sabbath night. And then the sixth characteristic was that it tasted like honey and oil. And the seventh characteristic is that the manna sustained Israel throughout the wilderness experience. How long was that? Forty years. Now I'm sure I haven't taught you a lot that you didn't know until now. This is all fairly familiar to us. But the one thing I want to emphasize is that Israel's literal, physical history contains very deep spiritual messages for us today. Just like Israel went through an exodus experience to free them from the yoke of bondage in Egypt, so too we as Christians are going on this spiritual journey whereby we leave the bondage of sin and we are traveling through the wilderness on our way to the promised land, which is heaven and the new creation beyond. So you see, Israel is a type for the journey and the spiritual experience that we as Christians would have today. Now today we're going to talk about symbolism and typology is the big word, which I use to impress wherever I go. But it just means a symbol where there's a particular message attached to. Now when we have consider these seven characteristics that I shared with you today, the first question is, if there's symbolism involved here, then the first symbol we need to understand is the manna. Because this was a very prominent miracle that God performed. What was he trying to teach Israel through the manna? And more accurately, who or what is symbolized by the manna? I heard the answer, I'm teaching no one nothing they didn't know. If we go to John 6, verse 48 to 51, and in John 6, Jesus was multiplying the bread. Remember the bread and the fishes? And Jesus multiplied the bread. And soon after he multiplied the bread, he spoke these words. Jesus saying in John 6, verse 48 to 51, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Jesus Christ is symbolized by the manna. He himself stated so in the Gospel of John. So now that we understand that the manna symbolizes Jesus Christ, now let's look at these seven characteristics again and see what the message is for us today. So what was the first characteristic? The manna fell early in the morning. An Israelite had to get up early in the morning to go and collect the manna. Now if Jesus is the manna, how would we go and collect Jesus? I'm not hearing it. Early morning worship, thank you. You didn't perhaps hear this sermon somewhere in the UK. Uh, I'm just checking. <laughs> so the first characteristic is that the manna fell upon the wilderness in the early morning. And so too, we as Christians are to get up early in the morning and go and search and collect Jesus, who is the manna. Now, we said that we will collect Jesus through Bible study. How do we know this? Because John 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John 1, 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is the manna, Jesus is the Word. We find the manna in the Word, and the Word is the Bible. So for a Christian, it should be a lifestyle and a priority decision to get up early in the morning and to collect the bread of life. That is our first spiritual application of these characteristics. The second characteristic, what was the second characteristic? Just seeing whether you're paying attention. Always the right amount. You could never collect too much. Now, in today's society, we have a lot of problems due to people overindulging and going to the extreme. 
But here we have confirmation from the Bible that you cannot overindulge in Jesus Christ. Whenever you get up and you go and do your Bible study to collect the manna, the bread of life, Jesus Christ, you cannot overindulge. It will always be the right amount. That is our second characteristic, the second spiritual principle for us. The third characteristic is that it had to be prepared. Now, reading the Bible is good nutrition. It's sustenance. But you see, we need to move beyond just the reading, and we need to start meditating upon the Word. We need to take what we have collected, we need to prepare it, such that we take Scripture and turn it into a message. Because a message we can share. In the same way as you can make a meal from the manna and share it. And this is where Bible study really starts paying off. And this sermon here is testimony of this principle. Because I read about the manna, meditated upon it, and I saw that there's a deeper message here. And so too we, in our personal Bible study, should be meditating upon what we read there. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he doth meditate day and night. Brothers and sisters, when we get up and we read the Bible, let's meditate upon it, such that we have a message prepared, and that we can share it with a weary soul who needs a word of encouragement. The fourth characteristic, what was that? It's fairly easy. The manna could not be preserved overnight. You see, your experience with Jesus Christ yesterday does not sustain you today. We need to start afresh every day. The Bible teaches that we are in a war, that we need the armor of God. We need to make sure we get the best start on the enemy every morning by waking up and feeding on a healthy breakfast of the bread of life. The fifth characteristic. What was the fifth characteristic? You are not supposed to collect manna on the Sabbath. So what are you all doing here? Now if I'm going to be consistent with what I said at the point before, then really we shouldn't be looking for Jesus on the Sabbath. Is that right? That would be a gross misunderstanding. You see, what this fifth characteristic is talking about, it is talking about us, as believers, it would be wrong of us to expect that we can collect Jesus only on the Sabbath day. You see, what this fifth characteristic is talking about, it's talking to a group of people that I call the seventh Day Adventist. Do you know the Seventh Day Adventist? These are the people who live a worldly life for six days of the week. Come Sabbath, they walk into this church, they come and sit the pews full, and they demand to be fed. You see, that is what this characteristic warns against. You know, if we were practicing the other principles of the manner, for six days of the week, we would come to the church on Sabbath not to receive a blessing, but to be a blessing. And we would go from being Seventh-day Adventist to Seven-day Adventist. If this was practiced globally, the Seventh-day Adventist church would become a source of physical and spiritual blessing to every community, wherever they are. This is what this characteristic is talking about. We are to stop being Seventh-day Adventists. By all means, keep the Sabbath holy. But please remember the other six days. Please connect with Jesus Christ on the other six days. That is what this characteristic is teaching us. Everyone still awake? So nothing new there. Sixth characteristic. What are we talking about? The taste. The taste was as sweet as honey and like fresh oil. Now, for the young ones and those who are perhaps new to the faith, because this is highly this symbolic. This is going to get a bit confusing. For the more experienced among us who enjoy prophecy study and understand symbolism, I hope I can finally engage your brain, because I don't think I've taught you a lot that you don't know before. But here we're going to go deep. 
So please take careful notes. If you see any pastors or elders getting uncomfortable and trying to chase me off, please just calm them down. We're going to get through this. So let's start. What does honey mean in the Bible? Specifically the taste of honey. I want to direct you to Ezekiel 3 verse 1 to 4. Can you all hear me? Ezekiel 3 verse 1 to 4. Now Ezekiel is writing down for us in Ezekiel 3 verse 1 to 4. And I want you all to get it, so I'm giving you time to page to Ezekiel 3, 1 to 4. And then we'll start. In Ezekiel 3, 1 to 4, Ezekiel has written, Moreover he, and this is the angel, said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, go and speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll, and he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then I did eat it, and it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. So what is sweet as honey? The roll. What is on the roll? It's the words of God. It's a message from God for his people. So if we read in the Bible of honey, then potentially it could be communicating that this is a sweet message from God. Now, the sweet message of the manna, we need to understand this a bit more. So, I ask myself, because I get it, it's a sweet message. It's a message from God for His people. But what is the message? That is what I want to know. So I ask myself, are there any other occurrences of honey in the Bible? Very significant occurrences of honey in the Bible. Does anyone know? Put up a hand. No? No hands, then I can't hear. Samson. Now let's go and revisit the story of Samson and the lion. And let's see what honey teaches us there in the story of Samson and the lion. We find the story in Judges 14, verse 5 to 9. Let's page there. And uh, I really do need you to page there so that you can check my wording. We're going to have to do a bit of unpacking here. Judges 14, verse 5 to 9. I'll start reading, Judges 14, verse 5 to 9. Then Samson went down, and his father and his mother, to Timnath. So Samson, being a young man, has noticed a heathen woman that he finds attractive. And he's invited his parents to accompany him down to Timnath to go and meet the future in-laws. And that must have been great. So father and mother are walking up ahead. They're not talking to their son anymore because he wants to go and marry a heathen woman. And Samson is walking along. And he's on his way to Timnath. And behold, a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hands. And he told not his mother or his father what he had done. He went down. He talked with the woman. She pleased Samson well. After a time he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. Behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands, and went on eating, and came to his father and mother, and gave them, and they did eat. But he told them not that he had taken honey out of the carcass of the lion. Now again, this is kind of random. Samson walks around, he kills the lion. Why would the Bible record that? To show us how strong Samson was? Again, as I said, physical events, literal events in Israel's history, hold spiritual and prophetic importance. Now, what would the importance of this section be? Who or what would be symbolized by the lion for us to understand this? Jesus, Lion of Judah. So you've read my notes. Revelation 5 verse 5 teaches us that Jesus is the Lion of Judah, the Root of David. Any, any other candidates? 
Well, what about 1 Peter 5 verse 8? 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he might devour. So when it comes to understanding this event in Samson's life and what the spiritual messages are that we are being taught, how do we decipher this? Is the lion Jesus or is it Satan? Just because I'm interested, how many of you say it's Jesus? Just put your hands up. We've got one. One is confident still. How many of you say it's Satan? Oh, Samson killed the lion, so it must be Satan. Now, I want to be politically correct and not offend anyone, so I'm going to say both. No, I'm quite serious. It is both. But you might say, how can Jesus and Satan be represented by the same symbol? And this is why I say you need to now tune on your thinking caps and make sure you stay with me because this can get a bit confused if you just get off the message here. So please, stay with me. We need to page to Numbers 21, verse 5 to 9, to see that a symbol that is relevant to both Jesus and Satan is not a singular occurrence in the Bible. Let's go to Numbers 21, verse 5 to 9. What happens in Numbers 21, verse 5 to 9? This very manna that we are discussing today, the Israelites became unhappy. They no longer wanted this manna. And they started to complain. Let's read in Numbers 21, verse 5 to 9. And Israel spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. What an insult to God. We have just seen that this manna was a symbol of Jesus Christ. And here Israel, God's very people, are saying they loathe this symbol of God's Son. What an insult. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he would live. So again I ask, what or who is the serpent on the pole? Oh, now, now, we're, now we're saying Jesus. So Jesus is symbolized by a serpent. Is that common? Whoa, oh that doesn't sound right. Well, first of all, if we go to Revelation 12 verse 9... Revelation 12 verse 9 teaches us, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Now this is getting a bit confusing. Why a serpent on a pole, when some of us say, well, it's a symbol of Jesus, because people got healed when they looked at it, but the Bible clearly teaches that Satan is the old serpent. What's going on here? If you're nervous, don't worry, we're almost there. Just stay with me. So first, let's understand, why are Jesus and Satan represented by similar symbols? Let's unpack this. The serpent on the pole relates directly to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Those were the words of Christ himself in John 3, 14 and 15. So right before that very famous text, John 3, 16, we find that Jesus Christ himself says, he associates with that serpent on the pole. Let's read. 